On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Ken Pickering. He is the VP of Engineering at Starburst Data. We're going to be talking about preparing to scale. I mean, Starburst Data is going through some incredible growth, and Ken is tackling some really key issues around technology decisions, handling the cultural side of a team growing. And when you're doubling your team, you're going to have to tackle some new challenges that you hadn't seen, uh, I guess, maybe even last week. So I appreciate Ken coming on to talk with us. Ken, thanks for being on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I know you're the VP of Engineering at Starburst Data. So if you could start from the top and kind of give us an idea of what Starburst Data does and what's your responsibilities there. Absolutely. So Starburst Data is uh, all based on top of an open source project called Trino, which was formerly known as Presto. But what we're really trying to do is be a single point of access to all data that exists in, in companies, right? So Trino itself is a great way to query distributed data. And, um, you know, so what we're looking is to do is first, we have an enterprise offering now, but now we're actually doing our cloud platform. So it's an exciting time for the company. And so I run all of engineering for Starburst, as well as like security and IT and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm a member of the executive team and I get to work with uh, a bunch of great engineers. Awesome. Yeah. So I guess you mentioned you guys, you know, before we were uh, recording, you mentioned you guys are going through growth and the topic here is talking about scaling teams. So I guess talk to us about you know what kind of growth you're seeing just to kind of establish a frame of a reference. Yeah, I mean, so we entered the COVID pandemic with about you know 50 people, and as we sort of near its end at this point, there's I think about 250, 270 people in the company. So in just the past year, the company has undergone like massive growth, and, and engineering is no stranger to that as well. So a lot of our challenges have been like, well, how do you grow a company and how do you grow it with all like the limitations that COVID has brought and, you know, what impact does that have on culture and process and, and all those sorts of things? Absolutely. I mean, and normally it's difficult if you have everyone with you, let alone doing it, you know, when everything's going through something that we've never experienced. And maybe it's a good idea to kind of look back and, and then maybe we can talk about how you see things going forward as well. So when you were actually, you know, tasked with obviously trying to build out more teams and trying to actually establish, you know, a hiring process, a culture, and, and obviously lots of people added in the last year that have never seen each other potentially in real life. When you first started thinking about that, like, what was your thought process of, oh my God, like, how are these people going to know each other? Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, and I transitioned into Starburst during COVID myself. I was lucky because one of my friends is a co-founder. So I had some pre-existing relationship with the company, but no, I mean, I think I initially sort of underestimated how challenging it is to build a culture and a team without that kind of like tactile kind of meeting people in person and being able to like, you know, have a meal or, or you, you miss all those moments in between when you're working, you know, like walking by a desk or you know, and, and I think, I mean, I'm, I'm no stranger to remote or distributed teams, but, you know, even in those cases, you would travel to meet somebody or you do an offsite and bring everybody in, right? And so not having any of that, I'd say, like connective tissue that develops in the moments where you're not like trends actually talking about work has been really hard. And it has been a challenge to kind of like grow a team, but also make sure that you're kind of keeping an eye on, you know, what cultural values you, you want to continue cultivating and, you know, which ones are, you know, are better left to a smaller based company. Yeah, I guess, you know, the one thing that I've spoken to a lot of managers was bringing people on during that time. You know, a lot of companies were starting to go, well, you know, we're all remote, so we'll, we'll hire remote. Was that part of your strategy at all when you're scaling? Or, or were you guys thinking, you know what, eventually this is going to pass and we still need to kind of concentrate on whatever geolocations that the company was targeting, you know, pre-pandemic? Yeah, the company has always had a distributed presence. So we have some of the original Presto engineers from Facebook that work for us. And then we also have all the way engineers all the way in Poland and, and you know, and India and, and other places that were either contributors to the community that we hired in or, or were part of the original founding team. So we have a, a pretty large office in Warsaw. So we were already distributed and, and you know, we had offices, like I had an office in Boston, an office in San Francisco, and an office in Poland. So we had offices. We were already sort of used to working across geographies. So we had some of the basic plumbing in place to be, I'd say, more geared toward, you know, like a COVID type exists where we're like, we're used to working with people remotely and using Slack and all the kind of remote tool sets that you'd expect a company that's distributed to work with. But we have had sort of the weird internal 
crisis of like, well, what do we do now, right? We've hired people remote. Like, what are the value of offices? Like, do we establish offices again? And I think the philosophy that we're going for is like remote friendly, but we will still have, I think, some office presences for people who prefer to work in offices. I don't think we want to be like 100% pure remote shop because I think if you do that, then you only really hire people that aren't looking for an office experience, right? But I think you lose a you know, good chunk of the population, people who might want to go to an office a few days a week and who need that sort of like ability to connect with other humans and whiteboard and, and those sorts of things as well. So we're, I think we're trying to figure out what the right balance is at this point. But, you know, we've been hiring people on both sides, people who eventually come back in an office and people that will be remote. I think I'm hearing a lot about, you know, people looking at different hybrids, you know, partial time in, hoteling, office space, because obviously people may not be there full time. And, you know, we're, we're at the tail end or maybe we're, you know, three quarters away through the pandemic. Who knows? That's a moving target. When this comes out, we could be back to 50 percent. Who knows? <laughs> but when you're looking at some of the challenges of forward thinking now, right? So you have put some of the plumbing in place in terms of, you know, where you'd hire people. And all of a sudden going forward, let's say we get to a point where next year, things are much, much better. And you're thinking about the culture side of the company. And culture is a very odd thing to me because it's so undefined. But when you're starting to think forward of you want to have an additive culture, how do you kind of handle having a mix hybrid of some people are there, some people are not, activities that are you know, going to include some people, exclude some people? Yeah. I mean, so for me, it's, a lot of it is, yeah, because you're right, culture is difficult to define. I think the thing for me is being deliberate about what values that you want to hire for that are like intrinsic and above and beyond sort of like whether you're remote or not, or whether they're social events or not, right? Like, but actually like what core values your company wants to embody, because you need a, in an environment where you don't have a, where culture can't be like picked up by just hanging out in an office, you need to be deliberate and communicate what's important, right? Everyone needs to have the same mission, especially in sort of the chaotic phase of a growth phase business. So I think like being like exceptionally deliberate about what your values are, why you hire people, like what is important, like what mission is important to the company and like over communicating that. And regardless of where people are, they know that, right? That information is accessible to them. Like it's part of your hiring process. It's part of like, the way you communicate about issues at work, right? And I think if you do that, then like you can build a foundation where like, I think a lot of the important things are handled like by the culture itself. And then you figure out how to continue reinforcing it and and build those social connections out. And like, you know, do you do, you know, like the random coffee hour with people or do you have like an offsite where you bring everybody in or, but those are really kind of reinforcing the existing mechanisms. But I really think that, being deliberate about who and what you are is really important for any company that's really intrinsic going because I think the option about not being deliberate is that your culture gets dissociated and people don't feel a connection. And especially if they're remote, I think it's it's exacerbated if they're remote. So I think that's really what we've been trying to do is being exceptionally deliberate about who and what we are and then trying to figure out how we handle that instead of like wherever the world takes us next. Absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking about you know, company culture is a big thing. And in, you know, engineering product companies, I mean, Starburst Data is a high growth, you know, technology company. There's also a subculture, a technology culture. Maybe I, I'm making up a term or a phrase, I have no idea. But there's a technology culture of, you know, at, at size 50, there's different views in the company of what technology is, what technologies the company has experience with. As you have the next 50, the next 100, you're bringing in people with different backgrounds, different viewpoints of technology. And obviously that has to also start, you know, there'll be, there might be some friction and the loss of the whiteboard all of a sudden is probably a massive thing in the process of ideation and kind of, you know, working through solutions. How have you guys kind of worked with that technology culture shift change and growth? That's an awesome question. The thing I've noticed is, especially when you hire, you, know, you hire a bunch of great people in, right? And they're going to have ideas, right? They're going to have great ideas coming in from wherever they've worked before. And, you know, and I think one of the things you really have to be conscious of is what is your process for navigating complex technical changes, right? I have yet to be at a place where an engineer has not like advocated strongly to bring in a new language, right? Like this should all be done in Golang or this should all, you know, it's, Let's let's move all this to Kotlin or you know, scholar, insert your language, Rust, right? Insert your language here. 
And I think it's important to be really like clear and concise about, you know, how we make technical decisions, at what point we would incorporate new ideas or new frameworks. And I think the first thing is, is identifying like what kind of technical DNA makes the engineering team better. At, at Starburst, we've, we've moved from kind of being the writers of a very powerful query engine to actually being the writers and now with a cloud service, the operators of it, right? So we had to bring in a ton of like, let's say operational and, and SaaS DNA that didn't really exist at the company. And, and how do you do that, right? Do you grow people internally? How do you share knowledge? Do you hire from the outside? But if you hire from the outside, how do you make sure they understand the more complex like data engineering sides of the equation? And that's something that we have been really deliberate about doing. So most of our, like, let's say our SRE team, we hired from the outside because those competencies just didn't exist when we started down this road. But as the company develops more and more around SaaS. Now that information gets more and more disseminated, more people get trained on it. So like for me, it was really interesting to bring in a team of experts and then let them build out kind of a process and framework, but then really to transition all that knowledge so that all teams now can learn about SRE and and how they should be writing performance services and stuff like that. But I think like really figuring out how you make technical decisions and how you disseminate information, especially remote, especially where there's no whiteboard, especially where like face-to-face communication is challenging because otherwise you have like five different teams all doing the same stuff in different ways, right? And then you get a sort of a convoluted mess from a technology perspective. So I think part of it is also visibility. How do people broadcast ideas? I have like a strong opinion on like information not being in private channels in Slack, for instance, right? Like that is a perfectly held belief that some people agree with and some people disagree with. But I believe that like information inside an engineering organization should be free, right? Every idea should be published, should be there. If you have a question, ask it, right? But like, so for me, I think the first thing was really making everything visible so that it, you know people could see what happened and could know what's going on, you know? And then after that, like, then you can sort of figure out where your bottlenecks are. And, but I think starting with that kind of foundation of transparency and accessibility of information is the first step in that. Yeah, interesting. I think I, I was mentioning to somebody on a side note that Slack is the new email information silo, potentially, if it's not treated as an open type of environment, because you're going to trap ideas there, because everyone was worried about email housing all that information. So we've kind of shifted it to like a messaging platform. And it's like, well, you know, if if other people are not part of that conversation, it's like a two-person email chain that dies off in the sunset as well. So that is an interesting viewpoint. And I guess just curious, when you guys are looking at ideation and the remote component of it, how has the team dealt with not having a whiteboard? I've asked this a couple of times. I'm just kind of curious because, you know, a lot of companies, I read, you know, Snowflake's staying remote permanently, but that whiteboard's all powerful for a lot of companies in terms of the technology side, you know, working together, coming through problems. How have you guys dealt with that? So we use Lucid charts and we write a lot of documentation, you know, and, and so, but now like every engineer gets a Lucid license and that's how we've sort of started sharing information. You know, we do a lot of Zoom. Like, I think I spend, I don't know if it's 80% of my week on Zoom, right? But like, you know, even if someone is just sketching something in Lucid chart in real time, or we could kind of look at it and be like, oh, like I see what you're saying, or like, or I can flip over and share my screen and be like, have you thought about this? Right. So I think trying to share pooling and trying to like figure out how you, I guess nothing really beats the the speed of the pure whiteboard, but you can get pretty close to approximating it. You know, and I think what's more important is that you build a foundation so that people feel free to communicate stuff. Like I think because that's what the nature of, if you think about like a whiteboard in the middle of an office, that's what it really is. You can walk by it and see it and be like, oh, like this is a discussion I might be interested in just kind of saunter up to it. So I think trying to figure out like how to get people involved in discussions that they want to get involved in is important. Like I, I, we, uh, I rolled out a process, like it's still on from open source, but it's a special interest group, right? Where, People like engineers that are interested in specific topics, there's like self-organizing groups where they can kind of like collaborate together and solve some of these problems together when they affect more than one team. Or so like, you know, we have one on process and one on like release engineering and another on, you know, like uh, React or front-end technologies, right? But like, you know, those are things that if people want to talk about style or trying to incorporate a new universal style, it's a great place to bring it up because then the engineers that are interested in that discussion know where to go. There's a weekly published meeting, the minutes are published. So the information is there and they see a topic they're interested in, they can roll up and, you know, I think participate in that. So I think it's just really trying to figure out how to give people the tools to do it. 
I like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously Slack and, you know, Zoom, all these different tools to kind of, you know, come up with a workaround and everyone's adapting. I guess kind of just kind of thinking forward again, you kind of now have some thoughts of building the team past a certain size. Obviously, technology, you're going to bring different views in. In your example of the SRE, you know, hiring for capabilities, when you're actually thinking ahead of, you know, the team getting a certain size, are you starting to think of different hires and going, listen, you know, potentially we're going to need somebody with startup experience, but somebody at the 400 person or 500, 1000 person company, because I'm going to need that type of experience. Are you still looking at, you know, I just need to bring in X talent to do this job. And once we, you know, get to the management, you know, and and scaling issues, we kind of deal with it at that point. Yeah, I think organizational design is really hard at this phase of company. And that's more like, Because like, do you take a risk on an aspirational hire or an aspirational growth path for somebody internally? Or do you bring in expertise from the outside is is like a constant thing you sort of internally argue. And I think a lot about growth is looking at your team that you have today and really trying to figure out how you can pave a strong career path for somebody and give them enough to like progress their career as rapidly as they want. But, you know, but also keeping in mind for burnout or like, okay, like, the company pace is now going faster than this person can accommodate. So what do you have to do to respond to that? Right. And so part of it is honest dialogue and talking to people about like, well, what their desires are and what the roles actually are. And then part of it is really, I think, you know, keeping your organizational construct fluid enough to account for, you know, like maybe this person really wanted to be a director, but like maybe they can't be right. Like maybe, or they've tried it and they're not being as successful as they want to be like, what do you do in that case, right? Like, how do you readapt the organization? I think keeping it fluid is how I've typically responded to that and being realistic about it. You know, like, don't sketch something that you think is ideal, right? They're like, well, this is how it should be. Work with what it is and work with, you know, who you have and, and who you can hire. Because you can say like, oh, I need a director that can, you know, manage a hundred engineers in here tomorrow. But like, that hire is going to take six months sometimes, right? And what are you really going to do for six months, right? Like, and you know what? By the end of the six months, maybe your concept has changed anyway. So I think it's really trying to figure out how you keep the organization progressing and, and how you account for your existing team. And then I'd say, you know, if you need to make an external hire, really like focusing your recruiting effort on it to close it as quickly as possible. Because if it is that identified, then you can't really afford a long search because the need is probably on the short term horizon. I mean, the honest truth is I wish I could project what our organization looks like a year from now. but you know, we're, you know, if we double our team again and, and you know, we're, we're, we just launched this cloud product, I couldn't tell you what the cloud product looks like in a year. I have an idea, right? But at the end of the day, I think the market sort of tells you what aspects of your product are successful or not. And that actually has profound effects on how engineering develops. So I think really trying to keep an eye on the future, but also really accommodating for the present is the best course of action in these types of scenarios. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, especially with the growth you guys have seen and probably are anticipating, I think that, you know, there's only so much you can do. I am curious and uh, you can take a pass if you like, but I'm curious to see, like, if you had the one thing that you go to sleep at night or, you know, figuratively speaking, or during the day that you're like, this is top of mind. This is my chief concern for the organization as a part of your job. What does that look like for you? It's always usually internally. I think that's the, you know, because I think, um, I think leading a team through this environment is a pretty heavy responsibility on me personally, because you know, you're not just sort of, you know, if you're trusted with the engineering team, you're trusted with a very highly capable team of, of very smart and well compensated people that are, you know, whose importance is intrinsically tied to the success of the company. And so the actions that you make have consequences, right? And so like, I'm going through a reorg now. And I'm trying to make sure we're doing the right things. And, you know, we're trying to really make sure that we're setting the company up for success for like the next, let's say, 12 months, right? Adopting a new structure to really kind of help the company scale to the next tier. You know, but I'm moving around people's livelihoods in an uncertain time in a pandemic. And I want to make sure I'm doing that right. Because I think I don't take for granted that if I change the team, that somebody works with, I'm changing their day to day. Like I'm impacting their lives in a very personal manner. And while it's like, in some cases can look like it's a, it's a box at at an org chart. That's not what it is, right? These are all people with ambitions and 
careers and desires and a really strong desire to make Starburst a good company, which is why they're with us. And so that's what really keeps me up is how do I make sure that if I do change things around, that it is for the best of the company and the people and balancing those two things out. That's like the thing that I most agonize over on a regular basis. Well, I got to be honest, I love that because I'd love to work for that type of manager because I think that's the person that's putting uh, the team in front of himself. So I think that's fantastic. And I, I love your outlook on on how you're trying to grow the team and, and kind of going through this high growth phase. And if somebody wants to reach out to ping you on anything you've said on the podcast, is there a preferred social media that you like, LinkedIn, Twitter? Is there a way somebody can get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn. I'm Ken Pickering on LinkedIn. That's the main business one. I'm not super active on Twitter, but at KPIC, I do check it. So it's uh, K-P-I-C-K if you want to check Twitter. Or uh, my email is really easy. It's Ken at Starburst.io. So any of those are fine. We'll make sure to include those in the show notes if somebody does want to follow up and chat with you about some of the growth problems that uh, they're experiencing. Maybe you guys can share war stories. We'll definitely uh, put that there. And uh, thanks for being on. Thanks for sharing. I think this has been a, a great episode. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And that's it for this episode. Of, and we'll be back again with a different guest, different topic. If you found value out of the podcast, please share it. We're seeing a lot of organic growth and I can't thank you guys for sharing it. So I'm not sure who's doing it, but thank you because uh, that's how the podcast has been growing thus far. And if there's something that you want me to talk about, please hit me up on LinkedIn and uh, let me know and I'll try to find a guest to speak to it. Until next time, thanks. 